First of all, the reasons why to work with models, um, and it depends on what you're doing, but obviously building your portfolio is a, is a good reason to start with. Um, you're, you're always going to have uh, you know, things you want to add to your portfolio, and it, whether you're a, pay, uh, a paid photographer who's doing work, or whether you're just a, a, a hobbyist or an aspiring pro who's not getting paid yet, you want to show a variety of different looks and different things, so you want to be able to do that. Um, apparently, oh wait, to build their portfolio, sorry. The models sometimes will come to you. They want a certain look that maybe they think you can provide them with. Um, they, sometimes they're getting certain work if they're, if they're working professional models. They want to be able to, to you know, add something to their book to try and get that kind of work. And if they're not getting paid for it, well, they have to go out and either pay a photographer for it or find a photographer who would like to add that to their book as well and you mutually collaborate on a shoot like that. And it can work well for both people. It's a win-win situation in that case. So uh, building, portfolio building in for both the model and the photographer becomes a real good reason to work with, with either a professional or an amateur model, for that matter. And then to experiment um, with anything. Be it, for me, it's usually new camera gear. I get a new camera from Canon. We just release whatever, new lens, whatever. Time to test. Okay, who wants to sit in front of me and, and let me shoot for them? So I'll call. I'll try and get in touch with a model or two here and there, and say I got a new camera, new lens. I want to test it out. You got anything you want to do? And then we'll go from there on that. Um, if you have a new lighting setup that you want to try out, then definitely that's a good reason to, to either hire or work with a model so that you can try out new lighting arrangements, something you haven't done before, maybe something you haven't nailed down yet. So you're playing around. If that's the case though, make sure that you explain that to the model because they're going to be working with you because they want something for their book. So if you're experimenting with something you haven't quite nailed down yet, they have to, un you know, they have to understand that this is a new lighting setup that you haven't tried yet and you don't know what it's going to look like so much. So you want to make sure they understand that. Make sure if, if you're shooting with like that, you give them something they can use also for their book because it has to be worthwhile for them to come sit with you for the hour or two hours or however long you have them in your studio or your house or wherever you happen to be shooting them. So uh, definitely keep that in mind. Sometimes it's trying a new location. Uh, when you're walking around, especially if you're like me as a photographer, you're constantly seeing places where pictures might look interesting, either of people or just landscapes or whatever. And a lot of times, you know, I'll, I'll, I've started thinking more in terms of models now and, you know, dramatic shots. You'll see a couple of examples later on in this where uh, I've been doing landscapes out at Montauk Point for years. I've, about a year and a half ago, it came into my head, you know, it'd be really cool if I could put a pretty girl in this scene. And finally, last week, a model contacted me through my website and... Uh, she was just getting started, wanted some portfolio stuff. I said, well, I've got this idea I've been trying to work on. I can't get anybody who'll get up at 4 o'clock in the morning with me to, to go do this. So I wanted to do Montauk Point at sunrise with the model. You know, I didn't want midday because midday is blah. But so she said, yeah, I'm a morning person. I was like, cool. So I got up Tuesday morning, 2.30 a.m. and drove out to Montauk and shot this model. And you'll see the results, uh, you know, coming up in a little bit. So, um, but that's the kind of thing, if you have a location that you... Like you have an idea that maybe we want to work out. Location stuff is great. And finally, to work on a personal project. You know, if you have an idea um, or a theme that you want to keep working through, sometimes you work through all your friends as, as you get through these themes. Uh, I know Alina's got her vampire theme that she's working on. Um, you know, if, if you have the, these themes that you want to work through in different settings with different people, a lot of times, you know, your friends either they're not comfortable in front of the camera, they're not quite what you're looking for in terms of a look, or uh, they're just tired of sitting in front of your camera because they've done it before. So it's time to find somebody else. So that's another reason why you might, you know, go for a model. And then shooting for stock. Those of us who I don't know anybody here shoot stock photography right now? Not yet. If you if you're working with models, you know, a lot of times you can do some setup shots that might work for advertising later on or they might work for you know an inspirational poster you know if anybody's seen those motivational posters that you see hanging in offices and or uh, by same effect on despair.com the demotivational posters <laughs> uh, 
you know, a lot of times those are just photographers fooling around with a model for stock photography. And if you have a concept that you can illustrate in that way, that's a great time to, to pull a model in and say, I have this concept, I'm going to shoot it for stock and try and sell it somewhere. And you can work together. She's going to be happy because you're actively trying to get her a tear sheet, or him. Um, and you're going to be happy because you've got somebody who's going to help you illustrate your concept. And so you're both invested in that. And again, that's another great reason to work with a model. The first thing you need when doing anything with a model, if you plan to display it anywhere, is a model release. There's a ton of uh, different good ones. You, know, you need it to display your work anywhere, be it your website, be it your Flickr gallery, on Facebook, whatever. You have to have the model sign a release. If your model is under 21, they must ha you must have their parent or guardian sign the release. So be very aware of that. Uh, it, it's just, there, there's no way that, that you can get around this. If, they, if you do try to circumvent it or you, you forget to have them sign the release and then you go display it somewhere, then they can, if they really wanted to be a pain in the butt, they could take you to court over it uh, as an invasion of privacy. So if you want to display it on your website, in your portfolio, or if you want to sell it as a stock photo, you have to have their name on a sheet of paper saying that they get, grant you the rights to sell the image of them. Uh, I don't know all the legalese. I would say better safe than sorry. Absolutely. I mean, anything public, really, if you're going to display anything publicly, then you really need to have a release for it. So, yes? Why 18? Uh, why, why 21? 21 in this state is the legal age of uh, consent for legal documents. In fact, the the model I, I shot yesterday, the model I shot yesterday, the release, I, I have an app that I'm going to show you in a minute on my iPhone, but the app that I have says that it cal calculates their age based on the birthday they give you, and it says their guardian must sign this. So it tells you based on that. I thought 18 was okay, and apparently it's not. So, um, For the release to be valid, value must be exchanged. Doesn't mean you necessarily have to pay the model, but theoretically they're supposed to get something in return for, for them signing the paper for you. Uh, be it a CD of the images, a stack of prints from you, you have to give them something for it to be valid. It's supposed to be an exchange because the top of the release will, will generally read invaluable and good consideration of my uh, appearance as a model in these images. Valuable and good consideration generally means you're paying them something somehow, some way. So make sure that they're getting back for you as well. Parent or guardian, like I said, must sign for minors. So be very careful when you're working, especially I, I've had teenagers approach me uh, who say, will you shoot me? I'm, I want to be a model. I want you to shoot me. And sometimes you, I'll tell them, well, does your mom or dad know? And can I talk to them? And uh, they'll, they'll be like, yeah, sure, no problem. Or sometimes we're like, oh, you have to talk to my parents. And that's a red flag. Run. Just get away from that because it, it can only lead to trouble. And also, one thing, and I'll get to this later also, have the model bring someone with them when you're shooting with them. Um, for your own protection, as well as you can, you know, impromptu assistant, if they're going to be there, they might as well hold the reflector for you. But uh, <laughs> for the main thing, you want them to feel comfortable, and it can be very awkward uh, meeting, especially with me being a guy and getting older, unfortunately. Uh, if, if you're working with a younger girl, uh, there, there's that awkwardness there, especially. It's one thing, if it's guy to guy, it's like, oh, hey, how you doing? But uh, sometimes the male-female type dynamic that goes on can be a little awkward. So have them bring someone that they're comfortable with so that it kind of takes care of that. Make it understood that that person should stay out of your way once the shooting starts. But uh, you want to have a parent there. The model I shot yesterday, she was 19. Her mother came. Her mother sat over on a rock, you know, off to the side there left us alone, let us do the shoot, but otherwise, you know, if she needed something, if something got awkward, the mom was there. So it was all good around. One thing to know, many stock agencies, if you're shooting for stock, many stock agencies will provide a standard release that they're comfortable with. Their lawyers have vetted it and have said, uh, we'd, like, we'd like you to use this because we feel we're covered this way. Um, some stock agencies, uh, I'll show you an iPhone app in just a second, um, some stock agencies will not allow electronic model releases. They want paper, which stinks because it makes it harder for you. You have to carry around the paper. You have to get it signed and everything. But uh, if you plan to sell for, for stock, make sure that 
you're using the kind of a release that the, the stock agency will accept from you. Otherwise, you've shot for nothing, you know, at least in terms of that stock agency. Now, what I use for my model releases, and I'm not shooting for stock, so it doesn't really matter that much, is I use Easy Release 1.7 for the iPhone. It's nice because I always have it with me with my phone, and it's, it's all digital. I fill out all the information. It's got the boilerplate legalese in there. I can enter the model's name. I can enter my name, the date, the time, all the information on the model. She then, or he then, can sign digitally, just scroll their name on the screen of the iPhone, and the signature is captured. And it creates this PDF. So my signature is here, model signature here, witness is here, dates everything. It then emails the PDF to you. It emails the PDF to the model. And everybody's happy. Everybody has you know, their copy of legal paperwork that you need to be able to show the information. Yes? Do you have a little stylus? Do I have a stylus for the iPhone? No, I don't. I've seen them. I just haven't bothered to invest in one yet. Yeah, yeah, that's all fingers. I think the model, in this case, it's a woman named Patience. She used her fingernail to do it, but yeah. Yes? This app is $9.99 in the iTunes uh, App Store. So I thought it was a pretty decent investment because now I don't have to remember to either email a, a release or I don't have to remember to keep the stack of papers with me at all times, which is a pain. Yes, sir? If you're photographing like the end of the, the, the model versus the model, You're photographing a specific model on a beach? Let's say it's a person that stands out. And, but on oh, the yeah, street. absolutely. If, if you plan, question was, <laughs> if you're just photographing in the general public, taking candid shots like street photography, so to speak, do you still need a model release? If you plan to use that for private showings in any way or for commercial use in any way, you need a release. And again, check with your, I'm not a lawyer. I know the basics of model releases, so, you know, Take what I'm saying with a grain of salt until you get confirmation from a lawyer on, on copyright uh, use and likeness use. But for the most part, any, if you plan to do anything that's going to generate any kind of money for you other than editorial use, editorial use you do not need a release for. But if you're planning to sell the stuff commercially for stock or display it in a gallery or display it on your website as, as a, a portfolio piece, you need a release for it. And on a, in a public situation like that where there's many faces, if they're recognizable, you need all of them to sign, which is one of the reasons why I don't do that kind of stuff for the most part, because it's just too much of a pain. So you know, keep that, that in mind. Um, if someone recognized themselves, say, and say you sold it for an ad for, I don't know, some kind of drug or something, and that person decided they didn't agree with what the drug does, or it goes against their beliefs or whatever, you could be sued, you know, because it, I mean, and it, it's a long shot, but you, you could, in this society where everyone's ready to get their lawyer's number on speed dial, better safe than sorry. That's all. So, it's a nice, easy digital release anyway. Like I said, it's convenient for me. I'm not selling to stock agencies. It's, it's with my job, I don't have time to bother with stock sales. So, uh, it covers me when I use these photos in my class. Uh, if I display them on my website for portfolio work, it's, it's nice. And it covers me for just about anything else, you know, other than the stock thing. Generates a PDF that's emailed to you and the, photo and the model. And then if you're selling stock, like I said, make sure your agency accepts digital releases. Um, chances are they probably, I know iStock Photo does not accept digital releases. You have to use their form. Uh, so you can go to their website, download their form, and then carry it with you wherever you go. Yes? Can you edit the boilerplate? Uh, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't tried to. For me, the boilerplate was, was plenty. It covered me for everything. Um, you can add your logo, I know, to the model release. Uh, you can, I used my iPhone camera to take a picture of the model so that it kind of references who it is in the, in the picture. So there's no question who's, who's this model you're discussing, uh, which works nicely for that. So um, if you need to edit the boilerplate, you're probably going to want to download one of the legal forms and go that way with it. Another good place to get model releases and other legal forms for photographers is Business and Legal Forms for Photographers by, Tom, by uh, Tad Crawford. It comes with a CD-ROM of stock legal forms. Um, there's lots of great ba legal basics for photographers. 
Uh, this is available on Amazon.com. Uh, probably B and H in their book section has it too. I, I didn't bother to check, which I probably should have. But uh, again, in today's society, with the, the litigious nature of people these days, always you know, there's always someone out there, and I'm not, it's not everybody, but there's enough bad apples out there to ruin it for everybody that you want to protect yourself. So make sure you know, you know, if you're shooting a building and you end up selling it commercially. You're going to need a proper property release from the building owner. So if you shoot a person and you end up, it ends up being the greatest picture in the world, it's not worth anything unless you can get their release to, to be able to sell it somewhere. So you want to make sure that you're covered for that kind of stuff. A book like this is great for that. Before we get started, what else do you need? Liability insurance. And this, this is a big one because if you're, if you're not a professional, it, Generally, insurance does not cross your mind very much. But if you have a model in your house, in your studio, or you're on location, and, and your model is doing something for you pose-wise, and they trip and fall and break their leg, you could be liable. You want to make sure you're covered for that kind of thing. If you have the model climbing, climbing up on a ladder for some reason, to, for some, whatever illustration or idea you want, and they fall, you could be liable. You want to, you know, because they'll say, "Well, he made me do it for for this modeling job." You need to be aware of that, and you need to be protected for that. So you want to make sure that you have insurance. And I, I, I hate to beat this stuff to death because this is the stuff that makes you want to run the other way. But you really want to make sure that you're covered for this kind of thing. So if you're not a professional, make sure your homeowner's insurance or whatever covers you for that. If you are making money off it, get some insurance. Yes, sir. Uh, the question was, what is the insurance cost? I don't currently have insurance because I'm working for Canon when I do the, most of this stuff. But um, about five years ago when I had my own studio, I had uh, coverage. It was wrapped into my gear coverage. So I had about uh, $50,000 worth of equipment coverage and then a $2 million liability policy, $1 million per incident. And coverage was about 150 bucks a month. And you could, a, a lot of that depended on how much gear you had. It's not so much the liability, it's how much equipment are you insuring because uh, the more equipment you insure and the more expensive it is, the more likely it is someone's going to try and rip you off from it anyway. So, uh, But call around. I used the Hartford when, when I had the business. Um, there's others out there. Check around. There are photographers, organizations, ASMP, uh, NPPA that all offer their own insurance policies. So check with them on those. For the year? Okay, through PPA, uh, this gentleman uh, paid $400 for the year for his insurance. Gear and liability or just liability? Uh, gear and liability. So that's about 40 bucks a month. That's not bad. So, but you're covered now. If you take a model out to a cliff somewhere for a real dramatic shot on a cliff and <laughs> she falls, oh, you laugh. It happens. It happens. And you need to make sure that you're covered for that. Next thing you want to make sure you have with you, safety pins. Sounds silly, but the shot I did yesterday out at Montauk Point, like I said, it was an idea that had been germinating in my head for the better part of a year and a half. Um, and I had a very specific wardrobe in mind for this. Uh, I wanted a red satin gown on the model at sunrise, so the red would pick up the, the warm glow of the sunrise, and there would be the warm glow in her face. The water would be that nice, cool color and everything. Um, the model didn't have the gown. I said, all right, I'll, I'm going to run around and see if I can find something. Uh, I found a couple of gowns. One store didn't have it in stock, and there's this discount dress shop in the mall. I walked in, and they happened to have something that was perfect. I knew the model's size, but of course, nothing's a perfect fit, and she, it would have needed to be altered. I got to this shoot yesterday, and the dress was a little too big. Um, so I ended up using a photographer's clamp to take, pull the back up and clamp it because I forgot to bring the box of safety pins that I left out on the counter to remember to bring. But throw, throw a, a box of safety pins into your, into your camera bag. You won't be sorry because sometimes it'll happen and you want to have that kind of thing available because you never know what you're going to have to pin up. You'll see some shots in here of a girl in a bridal gown. Dress didn't fit her. She bought it a couple years ago at, at a, like a Salvation Army shop and she grew apparently. And we couldn't, we couldn't zip up the back of the dress. Four safety pins did the job for the shoot. And then we trashed the dress and it went in the garbage. So you'll see. Have contingency plans. 
you know, especially if you're planning on shooting outdoors, you know, figure out what am I going to do if it rains? What am I going to do if the location isn't quite what it was when I, when I first scouted it? You know, maybe there's something going on there, maybe there's an event, but have some kind of contingency in mind. You have a person coming to give you their time for an hour or two hours or however long you set it up. Make sure that it's not a waste for them to come out of their way if something doesn't work out. And trust me, nothing ever always works out as planned. So you want to make sure that you have those contingency plans in place so that all's not lost if you show up to the location and there's something going on, something, you know, blocked off or the light isn't right, it's cloudy instead of sunny, you know, that kind of thing. So make sure that you, you plan ahead a little bit and know what am I going to do if, if that location doesn't work. So, Okay, how do you find models? Well, first of all, start close to home, and I think we've all done this a little bit. Friends and family. You know, I, I'm, this is my wife and kids, and, and I shoot them constantly, uh, and it usually degenerates into a shouting match because as a photographer, I'm cursed with kids and a wife who don't understand what tilt your head to the side means. <laughs> so, you know, tilt your head to the right, and it's like, no, that's not tilt, that's turn, tilt. So it usually works out that way. So start with friends and family. The problem with this is that most likely your friends and family, unless they're real hams, are not real comfortable in front of the camera, which is good for you because it's good practice when you start working with inexperienced models. You want to get good at directing, you want to get good at breaking through that stiffness that happens when you first start with a model. Even if you're working with an experienced model for the first time, there's that awkwardness between you as the photographer and the model as they get to feel you out and you feel them out for what works and what doesn't. I guarantee you, your first five or ten shots probably will not be your best work of the shoot because there's that feeling out period, okay, well what's he looking for, what's she looking for? Um, you know, how does he pose, what, what facial expressions look best on them, that kind of thing. So working with friends and family who aren't that experienced is good practice for getting into that groove, uh, first of all. The other nice thing about working with friends and family is that you can usually ask them to do things that you wouldn't ask a perfect stranger to do. So you can take a few risks with them uh, at certain points also. So that enables you to start within that comfort zone a little bit where you're not so much worried about, okay, is this person going to like me? They're going to be easy to work with. You know who your friends and family are. They know who you are. You eliminate that whole guessing aspect of things right away. The other thing this allows you to do is build a portfolio. You cannot, well, I guess you probably could if, if you had enough um, guts to do it, but realistically you can't approach a professional or an aspiring professional model without a portfolio. You have to have some kind of base sample of work that they can look at and say, I like his style or I like her style, I want to work with them. So you, you have to have something that you can show. Friends and family is a good place to start. It doesn't matter if they're you know, one of people's 10, 50 most beautiful people in the world today. It doesn't matter. If you can show a technical ability with the camera, if you can show a creative mind uh, from behind the camera, that's all your portfolio needs to be. You know, my wife is not, not going to win Miss America. She's beautiful to me, but she's not going to win Miss America. My kids, my kids are pretty darn cute, so I can work with them. But, you know, <laughs> you, if you build, up, you build up that portfolio with, with your friends and family, you, you'll, you're going to be able to approach someone else and say, look, I'm good with a camera, let me, let me shoot you, and let's see what we can make happen. Because when you put two minds together like that, then you end up getting a lot more out of it. Now, finding real models. The first place to look, once you, once you, uh, if you have a website or you have a Facebook page, that's a good place to start because every, Facebook, the reach on Facebook is unbelievable these days. I mean, a lot of you I know are, are either on my photography page or a friend of me personally. Um, I've put out calls on my Facebook status looking for models. I don't care if you're professional or whether you're not, but I'm looking for people who are willing to stand in front of my camera and do X for me and I'll get responses. So that's the first place to go. You know, th and these are not necessarily your friends, so I, I say treat them as models because they may be people that you've met or friends of friends, so they're, 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 now you're back into the professional aspect of the relationship where you know, a friend you can tell, you know, go stick your face in the water, whereas a professional 
you're going to be a little more ginger about asking them to do certain things. So call, I'll put out calls on my website. In fact, I got contacted through my website because I have an ongoing project. It's kind of got off to a slow start, but one of my projects is with either people or models is show me who you are with portraits. And what, what I want to do is photograph people, but not just where I have someone come and sit in front of me and, and look nice. I want them to take an aspect of their lives, be it a hobby, their job, their family, whatever, and let's illustrate that through pictures. So I've put that call out on my website, and someone, a, a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend, actually, contacted me and said, are you still looking for people for that? And I said, yeah, sure, why? And she said, well, I'm interested in, in doing that with you. Okay, perfect. So that's set up for the end of September now. So you, know, you put that out there, and you leave it out there, and you'll see people come up and say, okay, let's do something. And the nice thing is she's invested in it from her point of view because she wants these images of her. I'm invested in it from, in, in it from my point of view because I want to keep creating new images and challenging myself. So those kinds of calls work very well, either Facebook or your website, or you, know, you can put a call out on, on your Flickr site or whatever. It's out there. Um, classified ads. This is a little more dangerous. Be careful. But if you're so inclined, if, if you're you know, if you have a little photography business going, it looks a little bit better, obviously. But you can put a call out for models and, and be specific about what you're looking for and what you're trying to do. Um, I've seen some calls on Craig, Craigslist, uh, that kind of thing. I've seen photographers put ads on Craigslist looking for models for certain things. So you can do that. Again, you know, be careful about that stuff because, you know, it's unfortunately not the happiest world all the time. Um, the other thing is when you're putting these calls out, and then the last one is Model Mayhem, by the way, and I'll get to my, that point I was going to make. Model Mayhem is a models and photographers and makeup artists and Photoshop artists website for people working in the fashion industry. And you get a good cross-section from aspiring models and aspiring photographers to seasoned pros. You'll see, you know, models will say what they're willing to do, what they're not willing to do. Um, you'll see their work so you can see kind of what their look is and decide if it's right for your project or whatever. Uh, and you can put a, a casting call out on Model Mayhem and say, you know, I'm a photographer, I'm looking to do this project with, th these are the details, here's my portfolio, so go check that out and see if you're interested in working with me. And you'll get people contacting you because models are always looking for t ways to add to their portfolio, especially if it's a look they haven't done before, you know, and that they would like to do. Uh, chances are you'll get more aspiring models than you will get true experienced models. Those are a little harder to come by because they're getting paid good money to do their work. And you want to, you'll sometimes get them, but you want to make sure you have value to offer them to, to do that kind of stuff. So you may end up having to pay them a, a fee to, to come in and shoot for an hour. So Now what I was going to say though is, if you're putting an ad out, if you're putting a call out and you're going to start dealing with strangers, or you go on Model Mayhem and put a casting call out, make sure that you can back yourself up. That includes having a portfolio. It may include having a website, contact information that you're willing to give out to people. Again, you know, it's, it's one of those things you, where if you're a guy like me and you put a call out for beautiful girls for a calendar shoot or whatever, if it's, even if it's your own self-financed project, there's a creepiness factor involved there to an extent. And you want to make sure that you know, you'll get people who are interested, but you want to make sure that you can back yourself up as a professional. Because once you do that, I mean, and yeah, anybody can set up a website, but if you have a body of work that proves you've done it over and over and over again, that creepiness factor is diminished greatly. So you want to make sure that you represent yourself properly and fully to, to these people that you're going to ask to pose for you, especially if, if they're new as well. Um, the, the more experienced ones, they know how to, how to kind of vet who they're going to be working with. Um, the older one, the, the newer ones, well, not necessarily, so you want to be aware of that. Now, before you make contact with these models, like I said, you want to have a portfolio to show. You have to be able to back yourself up as a photographer. First step to that is the portfolio. You know, have some samples of work, have some 8x10 prints, have a website. These days with the web, it's very easy to, to you know, set up a web gallery and direct people to, to a website if you want to show them what you can do. So Model Mayhem allows you to upload 10 pictures for free. That's a good place to start if you're going to be on Model Mayhem. You know, get 10, you want, and you want to have them be fashion-oriented pictures. 
I, I'll, I'll get contacts from models who want to shoot, and I go look at their portfolio, and it works both ways, by the way, photographers and models, and they have snapshots of them at the bar with, with friends. And it's like, yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. But by the same token, there are photographers up there who their portfolio is literally flash on camera in front of a brick wall, and that doesn't really fly either. You want to be able to show some, some creativity, give the model something that they can latch on to in terms of your talent as a photographer so that they can say, this guy can make me look good or this woman can make me look good. You want to, you want to have it work both ways like that. Have some ideas in mind. If you're going to approach a model about posing for you, don't just call, you know, call them or email them and say, hey, I'd love to work with you. When can we get together? Have an idea. What kind of look are you going for? What, what, kind, of, what, you know, what kind of feel are you going for? If, if it's just a test lighting, tell them. I have a new lighting set up I want to try out. It's gonna, in my mind, it looks like this kind of thing. Or it's kind of like what this guy did over here. Check that out and see if you're interested in doing that kind of thing. But ha have something in mind that they can kind of say, yeah, I'd like to have that in my portfolio. Um, you know, like I said, I, I had the Montauk idea where I've been photographing these rocks in, in the lighthouse for years as landscapes. I decided I wanted to throw a model into the scene. And I approached models with that. I said, this is the kind of gown or dress I, I, I picture you wearing. This is the kind of lighting that I see happening here. And I show them one of the landscapes that I've taken and say, this is where you're going to be posing. And this is how the shot's going to be framed. And this the one girl I shot yesterday emailed me back, said, that's gorgeous. I'd love to do that. Let's do so we scheduled it, we went out there, and I, I pretty much got the shot I was looking for. So I was, you know, that kind of thing, that you'll get people to bite on and say, yeah, let's work together. You have a creative mind, I want to work together. Whereas if you just say, yeah, let's get some nice pictures of you in a, in a bathing suit or something, it's not going to fly. You know, then you sound like the dirty old man. And you you want to watch that kind of thing. It's, they're putting their trust in you that you're going to take nice pictures of them. You're putting your trust in them that they're going to show up on time and be professional about things. So you want to make sure you're professional back. Have as much information as possible about what you, what you, uh, what you want to do. Again, lighting, uh, wardrobe ideas, locations, all that kind of stuff. If you can show that you've thought out this idea and you're not just going on the fly, again, it shows that you're putting some thought into this and it's going to be a much better uh, experience for them and for you than just, hey, let's get together and just shoot. You know, a lot what happens then is you both show up, they pull out a couple of outfits, what do you want to wear? And you're like, oh, I don't care. You know, put on whatever you, whatever you want. And it's like, okay, how do you want me to pose? Oh, I don't know. Let's, you know that doesn't work. You want to have, a, have an idea in mind. Be clear about what kind of compensation you're offering. There's a couple of different things that go on here. First of all, some models will only work for money. That's fair. It's, it's their job if, if they're working full time as a model. They're certainly entitled to ask for that. Um, if the model approaches you and says, I want to work on my portfolio, you're entitled to tell them, well, this is my charge. I charge X amount per hour for shooter for three wardrobe changes or whatever. By the same token, if a model says, I'd like to work with you, I want to add to my portfolio, can we do a trade? which basically means either trade for prints, and you'll see TFP, trade for prints. TFCD, trade for a CD of the images. Now, if you do TFCD, that means you're giving up control over your digital files. So be aware of that. I have no problem doing that when I, when I ask a model to compose for me. I'd rather give, I don't want to be involved in print orders. I don't have time to, to bother with ordering prints from a lab. I would rather give them the CD and say, here you go, use whatever lab you're comfortable with. And that's it. It usually works out great, but be clear about that in the initial contact email. If you're contacting them, or if they contact you and you're responding, be clear. What are you expecting from me? So that there's no misunderstandings. The surest way to build bad blood, and it will get around because the you know, it's like the photography community, everybody knows everybody. It will get around if you, if you there's a, that kind of a misunderstanding. So you want to make sure. You know, she knows I'm, she's working for prints, or he knows he's working for a CD, that kind of thing. Question was, the TFCD, do I provide full original full resolution, or do I water, size it down, or add a watermark? I don't do the watermark because I want their prints to look good, and, and a watermark doesn't help anybody look good. 
to be honest with you. I, I find photographers ruin their images more by sticking a big watermark on their pictures than anything else. Um, I also don't size the images down because I, f I figure, you know, they might, some, some models I've seen like to carry around a 13 by 19 book. I want them to have enough resolution that that file looks good at 13 by 19. You know, it's, it's your images too, and you can certainly, I mean, a copyright notice in the bottom corner is fine if you want, if you want to do that, but they're your images too, and, and, you know, she may go to an ad agency, and, or he may go to an ad agency, and show the book that you photographed for her, and that ad agency may then say, who's that photographer? That, that's a real nice shot. I think we can use him for something. You want to make sure that those images look good. It's, it's, it's your work. So you want to make sure that the stuff will look good however they decide to present it. So I, I don't down-res anything. I don't handicap it by throwing a watermark over it. I'll put a copyright in a lower corner sometimes. I don't do that a lot. Um, usually in the, in the file data, I'll put a copyright notice in the file data so it can be gotten if, if necessary. Yes? JPEGs. JPEGs. The question was JPEGs or TIFF. I provide the models with JPEGs, and the reason I do that is because that no photo lab, in, oh, well, the high-end pro ones, but most commercial photo labs for consumers are not printing from TIFF files. They're printing JPEGs, so I give them a good quality JPEG file. I don't compress it too much. I usually leave the compression setting on 10 just to keep it nice and high quality. Again, I don't want any artifacting getting involved in my pictures, so uh, I do that. But again, just make sure you're clear on the compensation that you're offering because the more clear you are in advance, the better off you'll be. Everybody's on the same page. You don't want to have any misunderstandings. So first things first, have a portfolio. Now this is basically what I've been, what I had been showing people for a while. This, this shot came out from a call on Facebook to friends. I had a friend of mine who lives in Boston and she said, well, are you looking for kids? I said, I'll do kids. And uh, she called all her friends with little kids and I, in one day I shot four families with kids. So I shot her. This is the daughter of a girl I went to high school with. So I, I shot pictures of her in her prom dress. Same girl. That's a friend I went to high school with. And there's my wife. But if you can show a technical ability with lighting and with the camera, then you can get away with showing these things. This is a girl I went to college with. Show the creativity with, with the people who will sit for you for nothing because they're going to do you a favor because they're your friends. And you're going to be able to, to do that kind of thing. Now have an idea in mind. You want to be able to approach any model. This is what I want to do. I'm looking for this kind of a look. Are you interested in doing something like that? They may say no sometimes. Now th this woman coming up, she's a friend of a model that I had photographed. Uh, she's not a professional model herself, but she's, you know, she's a pretty girl. And uh, I, I, she asked me, when can we shoot? I said, okay, I'm going to be up in the Boston area here. How about we shoot it this day? And she said, okay, what do you want to do? I said, let's do some high key. I'd never done high key portraiture or anything like that. Let's do something real high key. I want to play with that a little bit. I said, do you have white pants and a white t-shirt? She said, yes. I said, okay, let, let's go for that. We'll start there. So... We started with something like that, and these side screens are really distorted for some reason, so don't look there. But we started with some nice high-key stuff like that, went there, you know, just basically worked the look. Yes? High-key high key is when everything is very bright, almost to, to bright white. Um, it's a lighting style. You have high-key lighting, which is this, where everything is white background, bright lighting, you know, no real deep shadows. And then you have low-key, which is exactly the opposite. Darker background, more dramatic shadows, very soft lighting, that kind of thing. So we went through this shoot and you know, tried a different, couple different poses in this outfit. And we switched. He had a, a, a white shirt on with some shorts on, so we went to that. And that was the whole shoot, pretty much. Did that in about you know, two hours in my hotel room, actually. So because I'm on the road all the time. I don't have a traveling studio or trailer or anything to shoot in. So it worked. She brought her, her niece with her, her 18-year-old niece. I actually had her niece jump on the background too because she was real pretty. So, yes? What kind of lighting did I use on the high-key situation? Uh, really it was uh, two soft boxes. Um, I had one 
one soft box to camera right. There's a strip box actually, and then I had another soft box to kind of off to camera left and halfway behind the model a little bit to fill in shadows. There was a reflector down and in front to camera left also, and then there was a flash uh, pointed at the background to light the background up. Because you have to light the background, otherwise you'll get cast shadows on it, and then that kills the whole high-key look anyway. So, now providing as much info as possible. With the model, when, you, when you're talking about what you're going to do or presenting them with an idea, I'd like to work with you, this is the idea I want to fulfill with you, you want to provide this, this information. Location, where do you plan to do this? You want to make sure, depending on, on the kind of outfits you're asking for, you want to make sure they're going to be comfortable doing that. The other thing is, if, they're, if the, you're planning an outfit change, which is highly possible because you may have an idea in mind and the model may say, well, I'd also like to pose in these if you don't mind. You know, you tell them where you're shooting so that they know, is it going to be possible for me to change clothes? You know, do you have a, a car close by that you can put the blinders in the window so that they can get in and change? Uh, or a minivan or something like that, that kind of a thing. As much information about you as possible. Email, contact information. What are you doing? Who, who are you working for? Why are you shooting this person? All that kind of stuff. You know, your website, your background, your intent with the photos. Tell them what, what am I doing with these photos? I tell them what, when I contact them and I have ideas, well, I teach you know, photography seminars for Canon and, and I'm just always looking for ideas to stick in, in my class presentations and otherwise I just like helping aspiring models, you know, fill their portfolio. So if you have ideas, contact me. I'll make it work for me. Tell them the type of look you're going for. Outfit, makeup, jewelry, everything from, from soup to nuts. What are you looking for? Because if they show up and it's not appropriate for the style that you were going for, it's a waste of, waste of time. So make sure that you're clear in terms of this is what I want. And by the same token, if they come to you and say, I'd like to try this, have them show you examples if they can of the kind of work that you're looking to, that they, they're looking to have you do for them. You know, don't, don't guess. And if they show you something that's really not your style and you don't feel comfortable doing it, don't be afraid to tell them. Don't waste anybody's time. If, if you don't think you can provide what they're looking for, it's not worth ruining your reputation over when you tell them, yeah, sure, and then you can't deliver on it. So, you know, that's part of being a professional again. So, Compensation, like I said, if a model requires a fee, make sure you know what it is and how it should be paid. Will they take a check? Would they prefer cash? How much? Etc. Many models, especially the, expire, uh, the aspiring ones, uh, will accept TF, trade for CD or trade for prints. TFP, like I said, is trade for prints. TFCD is trade for CD. Um, if you are planning a shoot yourself and you're looking for a model and you don't want to pay for it, be upfront and say, all I'm willing to do is trade for. You know, many will work for that. If it's an, a lot of them will say not accepting trade for work at this time. But if you have an idea, if you have a really stellar idea that's something they don't have in their book and it intrigues them, they may decide, you know what, I'll do it for this shoot. So don't be afraid. Even if they say no, all they can say is no again. So don't be afraid to ask, will you do trade for work for this type of shoot? This is what I'm looking for. And you know, fly to them a little bit. If you think that their look is right, I think you'd be perfect for this shoot. Your look is exactly what I want, but unfortunately I don't have a budget, but can you, you know, would you do a trade for CD or trade for prints for me for that? So, I mean, be upfront about it though. Again, it, it just, you want to make sure you're on the same page. The aspiring models, the ones who don't, aren't getting quite the work yet, they're the ones who will be more willing to do trade for work because they need the, the different looks in their portfolio. You realistically, a model doesn't want 10 pictures from the same photo shoot in their book any more than a photographer wants 10 portraits of the same person in their portrait book. So they're going to need a couple of different shoots to get a variety of pictures and outfits and looks and styles even. Every photographer has their own style so you know even though I have already about 15 images from yesterday's shoot that I really like I don't expect the model to put more than one shot in, in her portfolio on, on Model Mayhem because she wants a variety. You know, any model would because they want to show how versatile they are. Same with the photographer. You're not going to do the same look. That's why I did the high key look with patients because most of my work tended to be more dramatic lighting and I figured, you know what, I better break out of that a little bit and try something different. 
So that's what I did. Now if the model does agree to trade for, make sure you clarify, do they want prints, in which case you're going to have to pay for the prints, or do they want, will they accept uh, images on a disk, or in a gallery, or you know, email to them. Be clear about how you're going to be delivering that. Be upfront about it again. And once you do agree to a trade for prints or trade for CD, you really should process them and retouch them. You know, don't go nuts. Do what you have to do to make them acceptable to you, but don't send them untouched JPEGs. You, know, you want to make sure that blemishes are, are touched out. You want to make sure that the color is right, the contrast, the exposure is all right, etc. You know, you don't. I've seen guys try to you know just say here's some JPEGs right after the shoot. I've had models say, can you give me a disc immediately following the shoot? And I'll tell them no. I need time to edit them and to, to process them so that you're getting finished images. I'm not giving you raw images out of the can because it's not going to look right. How many images do I usually deliver? That depends on the shoot. I try to do at least 20 to 30 if I can. Uh, if it's a shorter shoot, then 10. But for instance, yesterday, shoot, I'm already up to 15 and I'm only about halfway through the editing process. So. I'll probably, she'll probably have about 25 or 30 by the time I'm done with it. And that's out of a couple hundred images, because I, I go button happy with the trigger. I, I keep pressing the button just to make sure. Uh, but then I, I whittle it down. You don't want to inundate them with too many images, because you'll see in a little bit, only one really does them any good. So. And then make sure, if, if, once you agree to send them prints or send them a disk, send, tell them when you expect to have it done and when they can expect to receive it. Again, this just goes back to general professionalism, but too many times they get guys, and I know what happens because I've had them tell me about it, where they get a, a photographer who says, yeah, I'll send you the disc in a week or two, and they're waiting months later to get a disc or to get copies of images. So make sure that you follow through. And again, this just goes to protecting your own professional reputation. You know, make sure that uh, you, you do what you say you're gonna, gonna do. Make sure that if you tell them, I'll trade you for prints, Make sure you get them the prints right away. So. Now on the day of the shoot, first of all, or the day before in some cases, call to confirm. Make sure that they know what time you expect them to be there. Make sure they know where to be. Make sure they have directions, etc. cetera. Uh, and make sure they have your, your, uh, your contact information so they can get in touch with you if something happens. That day, you should be starting getting ready before the model arrives uh, to, to um, to get changed and, and prepared. You should know that your lighting setup is working. Even if you're not sure exact position of your lights and everything, make sure that if you're using you know, wireless flashes that they're all firing right. Make sure you have fresh batteries, that kind of thing. Make sure umbrellas, soft boxes, backgrounds are all set up properly. Make sure you have props laid out so that they're easy to get to. Um, your camera gear, make sure that that's easily accessible. You don't want to keep running around to the back room or whatever to go change lenses. Make sure it's all right there. You want to work quickly. You don't want to waste too much time. So have all that stuff ready beforehand so that she can or he can walk in and all you have to do is direct them to where they're going to change and you're ready to go. Have some music playing. If you're in a studio setting, you know, find out what kind of music the model likes. That'll go a long way to making them feel more comfortable in front of the camera as well, because they've, they've got some music. And it, again, it will add to the energy. Preferably, it's something um, upbeat and not like a dirge. But you know, you want to have something that's going to make them feel comfortable and feel good moving around and doing this stuff. Uh, if you have an internet connection where you are and a computer, Pandora.com is beautiful for that, because you can go in, download their player or whatever, and then plug in the kind of artists that they like to listen to, and it will play a mix based on those artists that, you, that they like to listen to, and your music is taken care of. So what I do sometimes, if I don't have an internet connection, I'll go into iTunes and I have a selection. I mean, I, I listen to some weird stuff, a lot of heavy metal and stuff, which is not real conducive all the time. So I'll, I'll go into my classic rock section of my library and pull out a bunch of that stuff, stuff I know everybody can get into and like. So yeah, that'll work, too. Now when you're shooting, have your plan of attack set before you start. You don't have to map out every single shot you're going to take, but have an idea of what you're looking for so that, and what kind of poses you're looking for. That way you can kind of uh, tell them 
this is what we're going to do first and get those kind of poses out of the way. Once you have your, your list of poses out of the way or, and things that you want to do, then you can start saying, okay, let's have some fun. And, and there's things you can do there, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But uh, get, get what you really want out of the way first. Have the model lay out the clothes in advance so the changes happen quickly. Also, look at their outfits and tell them, let's start with that one and then let's go to that one. That way, while they're changing, if you need to change a background or the lighting setup, you can be aware of where you're going next. You don't want to be surprised if they come out of the changing room in an outfit that you're not ready for and you need to change the background and the lighting. So look at their outfits, have them show you what they have, and then sit there and say, that one first, that one next, and then we'll, we'll decide what after that. So. Have pose ideas ready. You know, if, if you have an idea in your head, you already have an idea of how you want them to pose. But what if that doesn't quite look right once you get the model out onto your set? Or you, know, you want to make sure that you have different poses ready. This was just for a stock business portrait, so it, it you know, didn't have to be anything fancy. I just wanted her sitting on the edge of the desk looking businesslike. Easy. But you know, ha we also had her behind the desk with her feet up for a more arrogant kind of business type look. Lots of stuff. We also had uh, her with a laptop open with another guy standing next to her you know, looking at, at the laptop. So, Play around with those kinds of things. Have the props ready for that kind of stuff too, so that you can again change off time is money. You know, they they're giving you your time. They probably have someplace else they have to be at some point too. So you want to make sure that these things happen quick, so you can get your shots and move on. If you're on location, scout the area prior to the model arriving. This shot here, this was in the Bellagio Hotel in uh, Las Vegas. And me and my buddy Eric Stoner, who is the Philadelphia area Canon rep, we basically walked the hotel and we knew this model was coming. We walked the hotel and said, okay, where's going to be good? And I, we saw these big columns. I said, you know what, a fisheye lens with those columns with the, a spotlit flash would give us a nice interesting look. So he goes, well, that's not for me, but you go for it. I was happy with it. It's, it's a little, I mean, I knew the distortion was going to happen, but, you know, it, it I was happy with the shot. It was about what I expected it to be, so it worked out. But again, once you, if you know the locations, then you can go from A to B to C and plan out the, the areas you're planning to shoot and have your pose ideas ready for those locations so that once you get there, you can tell the model, okay, go stand over there and kind of do this with your hands and, but, and you're ready to go. Yes? Yeah, we had talked to the manager and said, do you mind? And they're like, yeah, sure, no problem. People, problem in Vegas happens all the time. <laughs> they don't care. So Now location scouting. Uh, I had to cut a couple of images from this one because where we are. But anyway, uh, the, this shoot I'm going to show you here was, I was down in Maryland teaching a seminar about a year and a half ago now. And uh, my friend Eric, again, the Mid-Atlantic rep, had hired a model for Sunday morning. There's an outdoor mall in Rockville, Maryland that has some interesting little nooks and crannies to it. So we said, okay. We got there about an hour before the model was supposed to arrive. And we, we literally walked the two block stretch of this outdoor mall and said, that doorway is good, that window is good, uh, that storefront has an interesting look to it, we can stick her in front of that. Uh, there's an outdoor cafe, we can use that. And that's what we did. And you know, we got some shots like that. I identified these pylons that are designed to keep the cars out. And, and I said, let's get her leaning up against that. We can get the re repetition of those pylons in the background and add some, some depth and some interest. That ended up working out. Then we went to this outdoor cafe. And just the trees and the umbrellas in the background added some nice color. And we used the wrought iron in the foreground. The reflection in the windows. You know, it can be little things, but, you know, this storefront, I forget what store this was, but it had this curved glass with this wood here, and it made an interesting pattern. I was like, we get her to form to that, to that storefront, that can be interesting. And she happened to be wearing the checkerboard, which worked well with it also. So we kind of planned all that out together. Yes? Yes. This was uh, mostly available light with reflectors. We didn't use any on-camera flash. Yeah, this was about 7, 8 o'clock in the morning before anybody started walking through. Once we, she, she, she was not shy. 
so, I mean, there were times when the shirt came wide open, which is what I had to get rid of in this presentation, and there were times when the shirt came off. And um, I don't mind shooting that. I don't necessarily need to shoot it, but she did it, so I shot it because I was there. Um, but, you know, once that kind of starts happening and people start walking around, that, then you start drawing attention, and it's like, okay, it's time to go. So we, you do it early enough that there's nobody around, and then you cut out before it starts to become a problem because that's when you know people see a crowd of 50 people standing around watching this and then the cops show up and then permit questions get asked and everything else and it's just not worth it so you want to pick that kind of stuff out okay direction this is huge for a photographer and this is an acquired skill this is not usually something that comes natural but you want to uh, you want to make sure that you're good at giving direction and explaining what you're looking for from a model. Very important, work out a vocabulary beforehand. One of the things I will do before we start sh even shooting is uh, once she's dressed and she's ready to go, I'll say, okay, you know, and I say she a lot because I've mostly worked with female models. That's just the way it works. I, I have two ideas for guy models. I don't want you guys to think that I'm only working with females. I have two ideas for guy models. I just have yet to be, the one guy is all agreed to. Our schedules just haven't worked yet. Um, the other one, uh, I'm still looking for someone suitable for it. So we'll see. But anyway, before the model is, re is once they're done and they're ready to, to shoot, I'll say, okay, just want to work out a quick vocabulary. When I say tilt, I mean this or this. When I say turn, I mean this or this. I'll, I'll always speak in terms of the model's right or left, not my right or left. So I'll also, um, you know, one of the other things you can do is, uh, you know, explain what curl means in terms of curl your fingers up or, or things like that. Any, any vocabulary you plan to use, make sure the model's aware of what you're saying to them. You know, they, they, there's nothing more awkward or more tension building then when you're trying to direct a model and he or she is not getting the direction because either you're not being clear enough or you haven't worked out beforehand what you mean by certain phrases. So that can become very big. Very important, do not touch the model. And this, is, this, is, this, will, this goes back to that creepiness factor if you're, if you're a guy working with a girl, but it goes both ways. Whether you're working with guys or girls or whether you're a girl or a guy, hands off, it just goes to professionalism. If you can't describe what you want from a model without touching them, then move away from that post because it, it's not worth getting involved in that. The only time I ever have touched a model is when I have, in this case yesterday, I had the model posing on some pretty big glacial rocks out at Montauk Point. I gave her my hand to help her steady herself as she's climbing down off these rocks. I'm not going to ask her to jump from a four foot tall rock. But other than that, I'm not positioning her head at all. I'm telling her, move, turn your head this way or that way. I'm not tilting her head. I'm not touching her hair. Nothing. You know, if you got to be able to verbally communicate that. So. And then, like I said, speak in terms of the models left or right, not yours. Um, that's very important because they're not thinking that way. You need to be thinking that way. Yes. I'll have them do it. I, I, if I say, you know, I want a little shine here, or I want, you know, this here, or, or there's something on, on their face, for instance, a hair in their face, or whatever, I'll say, you know, can you do that? I, I won't ever touch them at all. Again, it just goes to a little bit of being professional about things. Little kids sometimes, you know, with the parent present, I'll ask the parent to, to adjust the child's hair or to adjust, um, if it's glasses or you know, if there's something on their face, they had a drink and now they've got a mustache. I'll ask the parent to do all that. And that even goes when I was shooting youth sports team pictures. You know, I, in today's world, forget it, it's not worth it. So I just always have somebody there who can do that stuff for you. So if you have a stylist. Somebody. Yes. If you have a stylist, that's, that's a different story. The stylist, and they expect the stylist to be looking at, at their hair and makeup and, and working with that. That's a different story, but if you, I'm talking, at least because where, where I'm coming from, I mean, I'm not out seeking paying modeling fashion photography jobs because I work for Canon and that's my job and keeps me plenty busy as it is. But I like to keep this stuff going on the side to keep fresh. 
So I don't generally, ha unless I have a makeup artist or a stylist who's um, looking to add something to their portfolio and looking for so to do something different that they're not being paid to do yet because they haven't shown they can do it, then you'll have them on set. But when they're on set, then they're expected to be fluffing the model's hair or you know, adjusting it or you know, slicking it back or whatever. That's a different story. But as the photographer, you shouldn't be doing that. So. Collaboration. This is where you build that relationship with the model and you get both you and the model invested in what you're looking to do here. Um, you're working with a con to devise a concept, a location, a wardrobe, and the completed images so that you're both happy with them, but it's definitely more of a collaborative effort more than uh, you know, calling up a model and saying, I want to do this. This is the idea I have. Let's, let's go do that. This was more of a thing where you know, maybe you have a model in mind that you'd like to work with and they've expressed they'd like to work with you, but you don't have anything definite yet. And so, so you start back and with the back and forth, well, what would you like to do? Or is there anything you've seen that maybe you think you'd be interested in trying? And as you go and, and you build these ideas together, you can really work out something nice. And it can provide you, both the model and the photographer, with something you both either need or want in your, in your portfolio. So it works out well that way. It can be an excellent opportunity for stock photos. Uh, maybe it's just something as simple as, you know, you know what, I'd like to do a, a, a shot of a teacher at a blackboard calling on a student. That kind of a thing. And you know, that can be the collaboration. And you can decide, you can go from there, well, is it a traditional teacher? Are you going old style teacher from you know early 1900s, say for that kind of wardrobe or, or and setting, or do you want to go the the whole other end and do kind of you know in a more of an adult look, you know like a, a kind of a sexy type look kind of thing, real stylized that kind of, thing. and that again that's where all this collaboration comes in and well what's the model comfortable doing? They're willing to sit with you, but what do they want? What are they looking to get out of it? How do they want to portray themselves for this kind of a shoot? That kind of thing. So you work together. The, sh the shots coming up uh, is a model I've worked with a couple times up in Boston. And we did one shoot where I was testing some lighting and it came out okay. And we decided to work again. And I said to her, well, I really don't have any ideas in mind right, that we can do right now. What are, you what are you looking for? And she said, well, I'm tired of being the focal point. And what she meant was her on a background, you know, just the model. I said, okay, well, what do you look for? She goes, well, I really love your landscape work. And those of you who have seen me before know that I do a lot of landscape work and I'm very into it. I said, okay, so what are you thinking? She said, well, how about we do something where I'm incorporated into the landscape? You know, I said, okay. So I thought about it. Okay, I got a location. Let's do this. So I actually picked her up outside Boston. We drove two hours north to Maine. And she had the bridal gown on and we started shooting these shots of her in front of Cape Netic Lighthouse on the rocks there. And uh, we started with this, and I didn't notice it at the time, but this little puddle here is actually kind of heart-shaped, which worked nicely with the bridal gown and everything. So I, I, I knew the reflection was going to be there, so I worked with that a lot. I knew the lighthouse was going to be there. And we just played around, and we got a, a whole series of images, her on the rocks with the reflections, with the lighthouse behind her. You know, this, this yeah. That's intentional. Yeah, I, I, I'll add vignetting a lot. Shot like this, I mean, where it's not a, a strict fashion shot, it's more of an art piece, I'll add vignetting if I want to. Yeah, that, that's stuff I do in post. I don't do that in camera, usually intentionally. So, But um, this location also, I'd been here before shooting landscapes, so I knew all the different vantage points I could shoot from on the rocks, above, below, et cetera. So we really, I really worked this location for, we've, about an hour, hour and a half here, uh, letting the sunset and everything. We went from there to something like that in this little alcove of rocks to something like that. Now this model, she's she's kind of in between. She's not quite real experienced yet, um, but she's not quite just a beginner. But she does need some help with posing sometimes. So as a photographer, you need to kind of watch that and make sure that you don't continually get the same poses and same facial expressions. She's very good with this face and she does it all the time. And she's got that one real serious, and I think she thinks she's being sultry. Uh, but after a while, she just starts to look mean. <laughs> so, uh, you, and, but you have to watch out for that kind of thing. So after that, I mean, I'll start joking with her a little bit and she's got a really pretty smile. So I'll start working with that a little bit. 
Now she goes back to being sultry again. And then she just goes, you know, more serious look. And we just kept working this, this, whole, uh, this whole thing until we felt we had kind of used it. But this is kind of the anatomy of a, a photo shoot. So yeah, you, once you have this idea, you know, it, we, and we talked on the phone. I, I said, she said, I want to be part of the landscape. I said, okay, well, what do you want to wear? And she said, well, I have this bridal gown I could, I could wear. I said, that sounds perfect. Let's do that. For me, there's a chance to do maybe some impromptu bridal shots. So if I ever decided to get into a wedding, I got bridal shots I can show off now. Um, she's got shots if she wants to model for bridal magazines. Now she can go and, and show some samples of that if she wants to. So it works for everybody. And this, this was a location. I had three photographers after I posted these on my Facebook. I had three photographers contact me. Where is that? I want to use that. This is Cape Netic, Maine, right? Uh, it's Sohir Park, uh, S-O-H-I-E-R, right by the lighthouse. It was funny. People actually thought she was a bride. They were congratulating her. Because <laughs> it's used, they do actually do hold weddings in this park, so. We didn't, actually. We did, we th I'll show you. We threw this dress, dress away. I literally, uh, on the beach, once she, she was done, she, you know, she uh, pulled a shirt over the dress, pulled on some, pants, uh, some sweatpants under the dress. The dress then came off, and it went right into the garbage. She bought it. This is where, it, I mean, it, it was full of sand here, salt water. You know, once it was done with this, it, it, like I said, it didn't fit her anyway. You can kind of see on the back here where it's coming apart. We had three or four safety pins holding it together. But, so, you know, but it, it worked out for, for the shoot. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to look good. All right, we're going to wrap this up with 10 tips from a model. Now, what I did here, this is Sasha Lee Pelagi, who is a very beautiful model. Uh, she worked with me at one of our Canon Live Learning events a couple of weeks ago. And we were talking, I was shooting her and setting up lighting for the students who were attending. And I said to her, you know, I have to teach a class in a couple weeks at B&H on working with models. It's, I said, the, the class is going to be a cross-section of amateur photographers and maybe some aspiring pros and whatever else. From a model's point of view, what should a photographer know when working with you? I said, if you can give me like 10 tips and just email them to me, I would really appreciate it. And what she gave me was so good and so in-depth, I said, that's my closing. So here we go. Um, First of all, tell the model what's in your shot. From full body, just head and shoulders, waist up, etc. They need to know what to be conscious of. So tell them what you're shooting. If, if their hands are in the shot, tell them that. You know, especially if they're down at their side. If you want their hands somewhere else, tell them where to put them. But let them know what to be conscious of in the shot. This is Oksana. She was also at that Canon event, by the way. Present the model with sample images prior to the shoot if you're going for a specific look, feel, or vibe. This is almost Sasha's words, uh, word for word. I edited it a little bit, but you know, this is coming directly from a model. She, I asked her to be here today. Uh, she's actually in Texas filming a commercial for Reebok. So, my loss, but anyway. Um, this will allow for her to prepare mentally for the kind of looks they need to do, the kind of facial expressions they need. Uh, what their body needs to look like. Also, um, outfit-wise, what they need to bring and what kind of makeup, if they're doing their own makeup, what they need to do. So if you can show them sample images, this is what kind of what I'm looking for, then you'll, you'll be ahead of the game when they get there and things will go much smoother. And I know I covered this already, but no right from left and the model's right from left. And then always speak in terms of the model's right or left. So if you're asking them, can you move to the left, say move to your left or move to your right. It's amazing. I mean, she, she expressed a lot of frustration about this. It's amazing how many photographers do not know their right from their left and do not know the model's right from her left. So, Communicate what you are looking for. From facial expression to hand position to where you want them to look. Models know how to pose, but they need some direction to know what you want. If they know how to pose, no matter how good the pose is, if it's not what you're looking for, then it doesn't do anybody any good. So make sure you can communicate to them exactly what you're looking for. 
come up with that common vocabulary. Um, if you have sample images that you can show them again, show them those sample images so that they can kind of get a visual on what, what it should look like. Talk to the model and build a report. It's hard to get into a groove when the photographer is so absorbed behind his camera that uh, he's not giving any feedback. Tell them what you like and what you don't like. You know, tell them if you know the smile's too big, tell them the smile's too big. Tell them to tone it down a little bit. If they look too mean, tell them that. Make it a joke. You know, why, what, go, go, you know, ask them, what are you mad at? What I do wrong? You know, you'll get them to relax a little bit. If you can build that report and build up that group, make small talk with them beforehand so that you just you start building that relationship. It, it's all about you know, relating to each other so that they feel comfortable with you and you feel comfortable with them and you can translate that comfort onto your images. This one she wrote a paragraph on. Have taste and opinions. Tell the model if you don't care for an outfit or a look or a style um, or a hairstyle. If you're shooting fashion, make sure you know fashion. Read Cosmo or Vogue or whatever the magazines are that are out there. Read them and look at them so that you have an idea of what the trends are. If you ask a model to shoot something that's completely out of style and is going to look dated, they're not going to be interested. So you want to definitely uh, shoot current styles so that their portfolio will look current, even if it does not appeal to you especially. Um, if the model feels that you're unhappy with something and you're not telling them, it's going to ruin the shoot because they're going to be very on edge. You may end up, especially if you're unhappy, you're going to be on edge and you're going to be uns unsatisfied with what you're getting out of it. So definitely communicate. They won't take it personal. Models are, are I mean, unless you tell them they look ugly. But, I mean, be, be, be uh, what's the word? Tactful. That's the, be tactful about it. But say, you know what, that's not working for me. You know, I'm... The dress isn't doing it for me. Can we change into something else? Or can you fix your hair this way or that way instead? You know, th that way, you know, everybody's happy and, and you're all on the same page on the, in that sense. Yes? Do I expect the model to bring wardrobe or do I supply it? If, if I'm looking for something specific, a type of look, for instance, the Montauk shots, which you'll see in a few, in a few minutes, um, if I'm looking for something specific where I told the model, I, want, I see you in a red satin gown on these rocks. If, if she has one, she'll say, I'll bring that, I have one. If she doesn't have one, I'll, uh, then I'll say, okay, what size are you? And I'll go, I'll go see if I can find one. And, I say, and then I'll say, what do you have if I can't find one? And we'll, we'll work it out that way. This girl had like a, she called it a 50s wiggle dress. Um, it was a real form-fitting dress. It wasn't what I was looking for for this shoot, but I said, you know what, bring that anyway, and if, if what I find either doesn't fit you or if I can't find anything, we'll fall back to that and we'll make it work. But a lot of times, and then I'll tell them, if, I, if I'm going for a specific look, I'll buy the one outfit. But then I'll say, bring whatever else you want, because once I get that shot, and it's going to go to something else Sasha's going to say in a minute, but once I get what I'm looking for, then we can move on to other stuff. And if she's got an outfit she really wants to be photographed in, or him if it's a guy, then you, know, you can move on to that and you'll get a little something extra out of the shoot as well. Once the images are selected and retouched, upload them to an online service to, so that they can order prints. If you're not paying for the prints, you, know, you just told them, I'll mail you a CD. One of the, one of the things Sasha Lee said that uh, a photographer once did for her was he created a gallery on one of the online photo labs websites so that she could easily go in and order prints for herself. He didn't mark up the print. I don't believe he marked up the prints for her. She, so she paid retail costs for the prints and made it very easy for her to get prints of the ones she wanted. So I, I think that's a pretty good idea, actually. I, I, and I had never thought of it, but um, it makes it easy for her to get stuff for her book when she needs it. And she doesn't have to depend on the photographer sending to the lab and mailing the prints back. So, yes? Yeah, I try to narrow it down. I, I don't try to give them a lot of garbage, I mean, just for, for giving them a lot of pictures. I, I narrow it down to my best, you know, 20 or 30 pictures. And that's what you give them in maybe web galleries? Yes. And then you said, and then they ask you, and then you retouch them? No, I, I retouch everything before they ever see it. I don't, I'm very picky. I don't like anybody to see any flaws. If, I, if, it's, if it's something I can get rid of or fix, or it's not looking 
a, a lot of times it won't look exactly how it will look after I retouch it. I want it to look exactly how they're going to see it. So I don't show anybody anything that's not done. You know, they, nobody sees anything raw out of my camera. So. Yes? I'll tell they they don't always ask. Sometimes they'll say, "Well, how many?" And I'll I'll say, "Well, it depends on what we get, but generally it'll be around two or three dozen somewhere in there." And they'll they'll say, "Okay," because something. Um, Sometimes you may get more or less. Than yeah, a lot depends on how long you're shooting for, how many outfits. I try to give a variety of poses too. So if I if I shoot three poses on one outfit, I'll try and give one shot of each pose if I can. So yes. I've had that, and I, I tell them, look, you know, A, there's too many to send you all of them, and then B, you know, the reason you're not seeing all of them is because I'm not comfortable showing you all of them. And they're usually okay with that. I mean, if there's something, they'll, they'll remember how they post for certain things. So what I'll, what I'll just say is, um, you know, are you looking for one, a shot in particular? And if I have it, and maybe I didn't like it, but it looks okay, so then I'll retouch it and send it out to them. Uh, if, if something happened where they blinked or I missed the focus on it or something like that, then I'll say, oh, sorry, that one didn't come out. You know, and what, what else can you do? This is the last tip from Sasha Lee, and that is don't beat the heck out of a look. It's a waste of time to shoot the same look for like an hour. You know, once you have that shot, move on um, and do something different. The model only needs one shot of the outfit in her portfolio or one shot of that look and style in their portfolio. Otherwise, it's, you know, 10 shots of the same look, no matter how good they are, it's a waste for them. They only need one good shot of, of that look or style. Then move on to something else. Have them change their hair, then make up their outfit, and do something else with them. There's no need to shoot that same look for an hour. If you can't get what you want by then, then you're probably not going to be able to get it that session anyway. You know, move on. If it's lighting that's not working for you, you know, that's work on it with someone who's not, you know, either being paid, used to being paid for their time or doesn't have other things they have to go do also. So definitely keep that in mind. You know, if a model's got three outfits, they don't plan to be there for three or four hours. They probably plan to be there for an hour, hour and a half tops. You want to pretty move through those outfits pretty quickly so that you can get what they're looking for as well. So. And then finally one from me, be aware of the model surroundings. This was from Montauk yesterday. Be aware of the model surroundings. Watch where you ask them to stand or where you ask them to step or lean or whatever. They may be so focused on you and the camera that they're not necessarily looking at what's immediately behind them. So you want to make sure that they don't take a step off a rock or a cliff or you know, off down a flight of stairs or something like that. And again, that's something you need to be careful for. That's why you have liability insurance, but it still doesn't mean you don't want a model to get hurt or anything. So keep that in mind. Um, always know what's behind the model, where the surroundings are. And I'll say, for instance, this shot, I'll, I'll say, you know, I, I had her with her knees up here, and then I had her kind of roll her hips toward me so that her knees were pointing to me a little bit and she was kind of sitting on her side. But I said, you know, watch yourself as you roll forward because I don't want you falling off. And, I mean, she knew she was, she was good, but at the same time, you want to be very careful with that kind of thing. You don't want to, these screens are not doing it justice today. Sorry, but... Anyway, you want to you want to watch out for that kind of stuff. Welcome. Thanks everybody for coming. I appreciate it.